It's also training uh, thousands of doctors and health workers from third world countries for free in Cuba every year, including Americans from poor communities. So with security of essential needs, just looking at these a little closer, um, health security, there's a free national health care system. The focus is on preventative medicine, pharmaceutical, uh, costs are capped and subsidised. You've got a high, one of the highest uh, doctor to population ratio in the planet and um, a decentralised health system where if, um, what's the slogan? If you can't walk to the doctor, the doctor will walk to you. And uh, Cuba enjoys first world levels of life expectancy and infant mortality rates. With food security, uh, there's rations for staple foods, uh, which sort of provides rice and beans for um, two to three weeks of the month. Uh, there's fresh produce markets everywhere, food prices are capped, and uh, Cuba's uh, urban food production has been an inspiration globally. Education is free. It's illegal to charge for education in Cuba. And that's from preschool to tertiary. Uh, Cuba enjoys 97% literacy, much better than many first world countries. Um, Cuba has um, 11, what is it? 11%, I think it's got 2% of the population of South America and uh, has trained 11% of the scientists. Uh, it's um, quite remarkable, the achievements it's made. And, you know, what I find really interesting, in a way, the isolation has protected Cuba, or maybe the government wouldn't um, cartel, but um, it's really sad when you look at... Uh, so many third world countries that have got you know, good um, health or education policies, how often those have to be sacrificed for loans from the World Bank and uh, conditions laid down by the International Monetary Fund for, um, for loans to, for essentials, you know, like food, and they've got to take their subsidies off um, food or their protection on their rice, you know, so home produced rice and uh, so it's, um, <coughs> yeah, and you've got to constantly remind yourself this is a third world country and yet it's unlike any other third world country I have visited in terms of the equity and the dignity of human life. Housing. Um, Cubans enjoy 85% home ownership. There's no homelessness in Cuba. Rent is capped at 10% of income. Realty speculation is illegal. It is fascinating being in a country where there's no real estate agents. <laughs> and you'll find, you know, three, four generations living per house. Uh, this is the marketplace in Havana. This is the plaza where people come uh, if they want to swap houses. So you can swap houses, but you can't sell, you can't speculate. And so uh, people come and they negotiate and then if they're happy with their swap, uh, <laughs> then um, yeah, they go and register it and yeah, it's all sweet. Fascinating, hey? Another world. Now, <coughs> one of the really interesting responses of the government uh, to the special period was a very rapid and radical decentralisation. Uh, they created local service nodes that were within walking distance. So no matter where somebody lived in a city like Havana, they could walk to a little service node where there was a produce market, a ration store, 
a dollar shop, a bakery, a butcher, a banking facilities, pharmacy, health services. Uh, they decentralised tertiary education and um, that's when the sort of if the doctor can't, if you can't walk to the doctor, the doctor will walk to you policy came into play. Transport, of course, was a crisis without fuel. So <clears throat> any form of transport was sort of um, utilised. People um, had to revive the art of animal power. And uh, so all the older people who knew how to actually harness an animal and create harnesses and train animals to harness and to cart were in very high demand. Um, pedal power is huge, as is people power. <laughs> And, um, yeah, I mean, the resource constraints in Cuba are absolutely huge. And you, the photo in the centre, uh, bottom, um, they're actually ball bearings that are the wheels for that cart. It's very hard to find wheels in Cuba. Anything that goes around is of great value. You get all sorts of taxis including ancient Mercedes-Benz. And um, it's really cute. If you look closely at the photo bottom right, you'll see there's a feed bag that's um, under the horse's tail that collect, collects their poo. And so there's no, no manure on the streets. And this manure all goes to the Organoponicos to be composted and turned into vegetables. So it's wonderful seeing these little recycling systems. We're going to see one of the gardens that uh, completely uses um, horse poo from the uh, local town taxis, horse taxis. Uh, there's lots of car-free streets. Um, there's been many strategies to reduce the need to commute. Actually, all government vehicles must by law, pick up people that are waiting for lifts or hitching until they cannot fit any more people in the car. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful policy? <laughs> and like you don't see gyms and you don't see people jogging because everybody's walking. <laughs> and you get so much exercise. I don't think I ever walked so much in 40 days as I did. Uh, that uh, those 40 days in Cuba. Um, Fidel's great last legacy was his energy revolution, launched in 2005. The key focus was on energy savings. Uh, there's been free energy saving light bulbs issued throughout the country. Uh, there's an ongoing program of uh, replacing energy uh, consumptive appliances with energy efficient ones, particularly things like rice cookers and fridges. Uh, there's um, microgrid generators around the country for uh, essential services. Uh, with the um, big, two big hurricanes that hit Cuba last year, the province of Pino del Rio got the full brunt, the eye of both of those hurricanes. Now that entire province had over 500 of these microgrid generators which fueled and provided health services. Um, so each of these um, provided energy for um, a health clinic, uh, for a bakery and for essential food storage. So everybody had access to medical care, everybody had access to food.